this kind of four-directional wheel, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have similarities, because all circles have similarities. And the more we learn about each type of circle, the more we learn about life. But it, it's not this kind. See there, it doesn't have four quadrants. And most people don't know that until I point that out. Even people that have gone up there, they just assume somewhere out of that 28, there's you know four quadrants. Nope. Uh, oh yeah, while we're here, this uh, walkway, there's a sign that says walk left. And there's this walkway. And that's an entirely new cultural thing to this wheel. It's mostly to keep people out of here. And all of these <laughs> posts are new too. But there's a YouTube and a fellow's being very authoritative and telling you that this is called Woodhenge because of these ancient wooden <laughs> poles. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> so about uh, two weeks ago, I think, a talk I gave in Cody, Wyoming, um, they taped it. I didn't know they were going to. And it's up on the web. And so that's, uh, I looked at it several times to see if I could find any mistakes. I couldn't find any mistakes in that. So just look up Star Circle, Bighorn Medicine Wheel on YouTube if you want to get a different story. But I wouldn't trust most of the rest. Um, so here just kind of lets you know where we all are. Here's Flagstaff, Chaco. Uh, you know the North Road out of Chaco? Well, guess what? It happens to go right to the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. I would love to hike that, just spend that time. And uh, Bucky, you could run that for us. <laughs> and then I live over here, just at the start of the mountains there. Now another wheel that I'll show you later in this talk is just, has that same 28 spokes like the Bighorn wheel, but it's up here in Canada. And then uh, the Blackfeet said there's one right near their land, but they put the highway right through it about 50 years ago. Yeah. And there's others that have been disrupted. So, uh, But these are the two that are still being held. And there was another big one somewhere around here that was on private land. Hasn't been touched by anybody other than you know, the wind and the sand and all that. So um, we do have a couple. This one, though, sorry to say, uh, doesn't have too many artifacts at all. It's been kind of dug in by miners and treasure hunters. But you see this neat little pile of mountains here. When you come across the plain, these are some of the first you hit, and they're high. Uh, there's a peak called Cloud Peak there, and even though this is dry as can be, those waters that come out of there, they just rush out of there. They're just full of life. This is the one in Canada that also has these 28 spokes. Its central cairn is much bigger, but its central cairn was never dug into. So we don't know what the Bighorn Medicine Wheel looked like originally. Um, this one, they only, they excavated only half of it, so the other half is totally intact, and it went down just beautifully through artifacts, right down to the ochre and the first fire, <clears throat> and that one dated at 3200 BC. Really cool about it is that at about 1000 BC, it stopped being used. They weren't depositing artifacts on it anymore. And then it started up again at 200 AD, and we don't know if same culture, different use, uh, the really different artifact they found was these little things called uh, bison stones. I don't know if bison is a big enough thing down here. And I can't pronounce uh, how you say it. It's like ish something. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, there was one change in the artifacts. Now, of course, here's where I got inspired long before I made it the Bighorn Medicine Wheel. And back when you could sit in Casa Rinconada, I sat in here. Uh, beautiful day all by myself and uh, contemplated why are these niches not evenly spaced when these builders could have made them perfectly evenly spaced. And that one thought carried with me through everything else I did with the medicine wheel. The quick answer that it took me 10 years to figure out is that the stars aren't evenly spaced. And when you have uh, something that has to do with the sky, you would not expect it to be evenly spaced. I have no idea what was on that slide. <laughs> so when you do research on this, uh, a couple people did research using this diagram. Now this diagram's flat, and there is no landscape. You don't know the horizon. This one has so much curvature and feeling and life to it, and it connects to the mountains, and it connects to the canyons. 
So I think, weren't we calling that field verified at one of these last meetings? That you can do this, especially if you know you don't have the money to go travel. Sure, pull out whatever maps, Google Earth. But until you go to the field and see if it works, you know, it's still just a fun project. Uh, there's an ancient road that goes up here. There's ancient roads all over this place. Um, when uh, General Sherman went to, I think, Yellowstone, probably to get rid of Indians, uh, he uh, used the roads, the Indian roads, because they were so good and wide and uh, had been used for thousands of years. So here's the wheel right up on top, and it's those posts again you're seeing. I think at one time, uh, it looks like in about 1905, they were higher. Some person even called them huts. They had uh, little roofs on them. So this is the environment. You're at 10,000 feet. This isn't a rocky peak you're hanging off. This is beautiful. There's more moose up here than I've ever seen collectively ever, anywhere. A beautiful place to live. We do have an oral history. Let's see if I put her next. Yes, Agretta. She was 115 in 1887. She was a sheep eater, but her whole tribe died of smallpox. She had to watch all of her kids, her elders, her husband, everybody. She just said that the lodges, the teepees, were full of dead and dying people. She wandered by herself for a while, and this is, uh, the crow moved into that area about 1600, depending on <laughs> which clan you talk to. And so she eventually joined the crow. Now, she would have joined him somewhere in her 60s, and if she lived this long, that gave her three or four generations of grandkids to tell sheep eater stories to, stories of this mountain, stories of this wheel. So today, the crow have adopted a lot of those stories. Um, and one crow I met about a year ago, when he heard about her, he said, oh, I don't recognize that name of Greta. But he said there is an old woman in our current, you know, pretty near history that was so wise. And it, he knew that there was this concept that she came from somewhere, but he couldn't place it. So he and I are trying to kind of figure out He's going to go talk to his elders and see if uh, somehow this is this woman. So in a way, it's okay that the crow adopted that story because they got it from their grandma, and their grandma got it from their grandma. That's how long she lived. So there's a story about her going up there in the winter and having a, a attack, being attacked by a bear. I'm not going to retell it here, but I do have it in an educational piece for fourth through sixth graders if you guys are interested, and I can send that to you. Uh, in fact, I have a whole um, lesson plans on this for young kids. But you can tell, let me just go back there. You can tell that even when it's snowy, uh, these spokes still stick out. The ground kind of comes up to the spokes. They're not just laying on the ground. They're embedded. And the ground is actually kind of worn out around them. So on this day, it was equinox. I was up here the night before in my shorts. It was so beautiful, clear sky. It's 80 degrees down here, about five, 6,000 feet under us. Look at this storm. I was gonna stay there the whole day, and I could hardly stay up there at all. It was freezing cold. Thunderstorm, it wasn't just clouds and snow. It was thundering on me. It was really trying to get rid of me or something. <laughs> or prepare me, I'm not sure. But people leave offerings. How many people have been here? Oh, this is magnificent. Okay, so people leave offerings. Maybe some of you have around this. Uh, this is also kind of a new cultural thing, um, we think. I mean, you can't, you don't see it in the archaeological record or anything, but you didn't find much else in that either. Um, so here's the different road. When I was showing you the medicine wheel before, we were down over there. The picture came from over here, up there. Now we're on the other side, and you park your car, and then you walk about a uh, mile and a half or so. Definitely take a coat, even in the middle of the summer. Uh, it's really cold. This is just a view from near the top, so you can see all these cool canyons going down, just beautiful grassy landscapes, water everywhere. And this is your first look at the wheel. It's wood hinge. <laughs> it is not wood hinge. <laughs> but I guess that might be a new cultural name for it. But you can see some of the rocks, so you can kind of imagine almost the, the awareness of coming up and just seeing it kind of unfold as you came closer. 
Now, what Greta said about her people, they're very peaceful. They didn't want to live down below in the flies. They loved it up there where it was cool, and they had plenty of grass. And uh, she said our women were as beautiful as the sun. She really talked about their morality. She talked about the Sioux. Now, this was translated, in, and at that time, 1887, when she was interviewed, you got to really be careful with things like people calling a group the Sioux, because even today, the Sioux has a lot of different elements and uh, nations in it. And back then, you could have all sorts of stragglers from all sorts of people pushed west. So be careful with that. But um, anyway, she said they came up, they were horse people, the Sioux were, and Greta and her people were not. They had these beautiful bows made out of sheep horn that were just amazingly good bows. Everybody wanted them. And so the, the Sioux were coming up those canyons you saw. And uh, the people up here said, no, no, don't come. We don't want to have any problem with you. Anyway, they came, and sheep eaters could defend themselves. They rolled a bunch of rocks down those canyons and killed every human horse and dog. So they weren't defenseless. Now, she got married to that same fellow that helped save her from the bear. And she talked about it happening in springtime. Well, there's my astronomy. As soon as you hear a season, there's your astronomy. So springtime, what is springtime up there? Okay, it's very different than down here. The first flowers that bloom, these guys, once the snow is, there's probably snow right over here somewhere. These will disappear within days after the snow has disappeared. This is springtime. This is the longest day with the most light of the whole year. That's springtime. <laughs> You guys see those stars? See anything familiar at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I wish you could see better is this landscape. Just follow my laser. It kind of actually dips to the north and comes back up. And I kept trying to think, oh my gosh, does it dip exactly at the north? Is this, you know, set up on purpose? And when you tried to use your own, uh, I'm going to call it a magnetometer, but uh, compass. <laughs> You, it's just crazy up there. And when you look at all the old maps, they always throw a north, and you don't know if it's magnetic, compass north, true north. And I have measured that with compasses, oh, four or five years before I got this picture, and all of my compass readings were different. Didn't matter what I took them with. And so I was so glad that night to have, there's your Big Dipper, point to Polaris, and what I had to do is wait till the time of the night. Polaris isn't exactly at the north either, but it makes this little circle. So twice during a 24-hour period, it's going to hit that meridian and be to the true north. So I waited until that time and then had the photographer take this picture. So we now have a picture of where north is. And sure enough, it's right. They put it with the landscape. They put it with the wheel. It's all working. This is actually a night where there's a lot of smoke. We get smoke in uh, August really bad in Montana. Don't ever bother to go there in August. And we were waiting for Jupiter. And one of the things of practicing astronomy is trying to predict where you think something will come up and then see how close you are. And the moon is the craziest thing, is trying to predict it from one night to the next. Has anybody done that? Oh my gosh, it is really, really hard. And then to try to figure out what shape it has. Is it going to hang like this, like this? You'd think it'd be straightforward, but it is not. But anyway, this is the moon, this is Jupiter, just the way the camera took it. And fortunately, it did come up on <laughs> really close to where we thought it would. This star, Capella, which was part of that, uh, the sea bear, I don't know what you call him, with the big pack on his back, you see in the southwest? Yeah, yeah. Um, when uh, that was laid out, Capella was actually part of that. I thought that was very interesting when he showed us that. But anyway, Capella up here makes that dip all the way into the north that I showed you. Capella dips right into that dip and comes back and then comes right above the center cairn. Now, you could say, well, was that now or 5,000 years ago? Well, Capella is one of those stars like Sirius that has its own proper motion that kind of works and adjusts to the precession of the equinoxes. And so that star has been doing that for thousands of years. I don't even know what to say about the little people. But I would tell you something an elder told me about them. He said, they're called little people, but they're not people. They're beings. Um, they can come in all sorts of forms. They don't much like humans, actually. They think we're rather stinky. But 
They're willing to help us because they see that we're so directionless. And so uh, up in that area, the people will go and have vision quests and hope that the little people will come and guide them and give them some direction for their life. And I put this picture of the cave in because the little people, uh, I don't think they're in any way limited to the caves, but there's an amazing cave structure under this. It's kind of like the below world and the little people live there. And uh, the folks up there spend a lot of time trying to protect the areas where they know where the little people hang out. So here's a crow fellow of the same group of crow I talked about earlier. Uh, 1916, he would guide people up there. Uh, a lot of the crow didn't know where this was. They had stories of it, because they had a fellow in their history, probably 300 years earlier, who went up there and did have a vision quest, and the little people helped him understand how the bighorn medicine wheel worked. This is where he was having his vision quest. Uh, I mean, I don't know which Karen, but he was up on this mountain. He left there after the little people helped him and built this medicine wheel. Now, years ago in the 70s, there were some uh, archaeologists who were really against this medicine wheel having anything to do with stars. And uh, they did, one fellow did a study, and he looked at all these angles on all these different wheels. He didn't even look at just astronomical ones. He just grabbed every wheel he could find. And he even got them from different reports where they put all the crazy north, north on them and everything. So it had a lot of problems. But the worst problem it had is that you can't tell from this. You can't tell from how they're pointing. Without that landscape, if you've got the sun coming up and you've got a hill in the way, that sun's going to go farther to a different angle before it comes up. So unless you did that study with that context of your landscape in mind, you're just going to get garbage, which he did. But somehow he got a PhD on it. I don't know. But anyway, uh, Scarface, the crow, he did learn how to use this. And these do align to the same stars even though um, it doesn't look like that, unless you go there and check it out. The glorious Milky Way. So the one feature about this is the solstice line. And uh, many people, the indigenous people, already knew it pointed to the rising sun and solstice. But uh, it also actually interacts with the galaxy, but I'm not going to take time to tell you. Um, I sent a student up there to get some pictures for me because I was busy somewhere else. And he got his camera and his friends up before dawn and got up there. And he said, Ivy, I'm so sorry, but my picture, it won't line up with the sun no matter what I do. And he was really depressed about it because he conned all his friends into going, on. I just said, this is the best news, Amiel. Now we can date that solstice alignment. And so they tried to date it with archaeology. Here's the guy that, that did go out there with Western science stuff. Um, but anyway, he, he used the theodolite and stuff and figured out that this was the summer solstice line, but he's kind of fudging. He said in the paper that it was about a degree off, but he figured that was close enough. Well, I'll tell you, I have a lot more respect for ancient astronomers. They weren't close enough. They were dead on. So you got to keep looking until you figure out when uh, they set it up for. Another archaeologist that didn't even want me to talk about astronomy, he actually yelled at me at an anthropology meeting and told me I didn't belong there. He went up there and studied for a couple months, a whole couple months. And I said, well, did you see any patterns between the wheel and the sky? And he said, well, no, it was foggy the whole time. <laughs> and I never went up there at dark. I'm like, OK. <laughs> uh, this one is kind of where we lost it, you guys, where, where this culture lost the sky. It was a while ago. It was when they started looking through telescopes instead of looking at their object. This is just showing you the similarity between the sun stations. And then uh, one of the people on my committee said, how can you take a circle and know anything about stars? It could point to any stars. Yeah, it's a good thing it can. And it does. And the person who uses it can use it in any way they want. These guys use pieces of coral and the segments between them that divide up the sky. And the way they do it is each one of these represent a star, and they have a story that goes with them. And the story tells you of the movement of that star. And stories are a hell of a lot easier to remember than declination and right ascension. This, this is advanced science. This is just showing you that the wheel has not changed. You know, Some people say, oh, those rocks have been moved. Oh, no, I've tried to move them. They don't move. I mean, there's some laying on top. So back to our measurement. Uh, when I looked at that with my naked eye, you can't see it here, but there's a rock that's just 
It's actually an outcrop that's right aligned with that solstice line. It took me three years to find it, but when I found it, <laughs> this thing had a hole going through it, looking back at the wheel. And look at the landscape behind him. When that sun came up at one point in time, yeah, it would have just popped right through there back at the wheel. Just I can't imagine what that'd feel like to stand at the wheel and just have it come through there. So we measured it all up. That's my husband taking pictures. And remember that meadow I asked you to remember? That's right underneath the wheel. So the wheel's pretty much center of this. Now, since we dated this at about 5,000 years ago, I have no idea if 5,000 years ago that was, you know, more obviously hollowed out. So here's that solstice can in the alignment that Eddie found. And then here's the rock out there that I could see in the alignment. But when he measured the solstice, it was over here a ways. So he just said, oh, that's, that's an error. In Western science, it's okay to have some error. But it's not an error. Um, so here's your solstice, Karen, again, going through the main wheel, four or three miles away. Now here's that rock I just showed you in the hole. And it, you can actually see the glow of that circle just from the light of the sky, even before the sun comes up. You don't even need the sun to be beaming through it. You can actually see the glow. It's pretty cool. Um, so when I measured it, the sun actually came up about a degree and a half from it. Um, now, I did other things, and this is just the Western science part, but uh, in indigenous science, you wouldn't need these numbers. Our brain is so amazing. You could tell just by the distance. Like, watch this. I can walk around this chair and come back, and I didn't have to use any calculus. My brain did that. And it can do the same thing with this. Your brain can track distances and angles. But because this is a Western science paper I'm submitting, I did all the Western science, and I measured Altair, and we know from our star programs and all of our uh, math where that would be at a specific point in time. I got it with atomic time. I also measured where Sirius comes up, because I had found that before. It comes up through this really cool rock hoodoo here. Just fantastic rising about August 7th. And then this is that radome. I just threw that up there because it was a solid, steady measurement I could use. So I picked things that aren't going to move, like this rock and this gray dome, and then uh, got the star at a certain time, and then got this too. And then once I did this, you're not done. It's not just this difference between them. You have to take these back to the horizon. This would be the astronomical zero, like zero altitude, and they go up in altitude and across in azimuth. So you take it back to that, but you can't take it really straight down. You have to arc it down, and you have to arc it down, not the arc it uses today. That's the one I use for today's sun. I have to arc this down to the point in time where it would have had the correct arc to even get in there. So it's a multi-step process. Um, there's programs that help you with it, but you always want to know all the limits of your star programs, and then you also want to use some spherical trigonometry to figure it out and see if they both agree. When I did that, oh, and also there's uh, the atmosphere will change the, the globe, where things move on the horizon. And the trick is we don't really know what the atmosphere was like 5,000 years ago. We can kind of guess. So some of those guess factors come in, and I was very conservative. It could be 800 years older. But anyway, it, it lined out to be uh, 3200 BC. The solstice back then was July 20th. Um, and just to let you know what a tiny amount that is, if you're measuring the stars over time, you get a lot bigger. You got degrees to work with. With the sun, it's just the smallest amount in the sky. The difference between these two stars, Alnitak and Alnilam, is this little tiny same amount the sun has moved. But your eye can see it. We're done right at the end. And so in my book, I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I want you to be aware of it. The research I had done before showed how these constellations fit with this. And what's most important is over this big cycle of time, you have different stars that are pole stars. Polaris is not always it. In fact, uh, Thuban was the pole star uh, 3,000 years ago. So when you lay this all out, it turns out this wheel is not a circle. It is the exact dimensions of the pole stars over that. And it doesn't work if you reverse it. It took me three years to get it and end this ceremony to figure out which way to do it. Okay, last thing, Chris. Very important. In those constellations I showed you, in the way the wheel's set up, and it's set up on this ecliptic North Pole, 
Um, there's Deneb, that's the solstice cairn. This, this, this uh, wheel does several things. It's not simple like we are today. It's very complex, very sophisticated. And one of the things it does is the solstice cairn, if you look at that rising sun 3,200 years before, it goes right across that place where I just showed you Thuban and goes to it. So the whole thing is a picture of the sky. This last part isn't in my book because I just figured it out two years ago. So these were the first people to find out about this because they showed up the next morning. And uh, they're, and it's good because they are the grandkids of the grandkids of the grandkids of a Greta. And they just happened to get there the next day and be the first ones to learn. Here's, if you looked up from that central cairn to see what's in that center part of that north northern circle, it's this. And it could have been visible. It probably exploded a 1,000 years ago. So it might have been doing some kind of Nova thing. They might have actually been able to see that. OK, that's it, guys. <laughs>